Hi everyone. My name is Karen Sanders and I'm a member of MU Sasha and I'm very excited today to introduce our next speaker, Anthony Magnabosco. Anthony is from San Antonio and has spoken with nearly a thousand people on a wide variety of topics such as ghosts, aliens, magic, karma, prayers, miracles, political topics, and of course gods. He respectfully speaks with people using street epistemology to uncover the reliability of the methods used to arrive at deeply held beliefs. The conversations are often limited, or often filmed so others can see the effectiveness of the approach and eventually feel comfortable enough to try it for themselves. These talks are usually typically friendly, informative, and fun. Anthony even arrived a day before this conference to speak with people right here on campus. Anthony has appeared on the Thinking Atheist podcast, the Friendly Atheist blog and podcast, mentioned by the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Science and Reason, and is scheduled to speak with the atheist community of Austin in June. His YouTube channel is MagnaBosco210, and he can also be found on Twitter. Today he's here to speak with us about the topic, Street Epistemology, an Effective Response to Credulity. So without further ado, let's please give Anthony a warm welcome. Good afternoon. How's everybody? Great. Good, good, me too. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It was excellent. Appreciate that. Just a couple brief notes. We are recording this, and it's going to be, make it easier if we can wait for the questions and answers session to the very end. So save those questions. I want to answer them, but just hold off to the end, please. That'd be great. Like Karen said, I've had hundreds of conversations with believers. And when I first started out doing it, it went bad. Like off the rails bad, argumentation, fighting, pushing, and even alienating myself from the loved ones in my life. In fact, many of you might be able to relate to that, where you argue with those pe the people and your friends and family, only to find out that you've ended up pushing them away. But I learned a new technique and I'm eager to share that with you today. And it's called street epistemology. And when I was invited to come to speak to your conference, I jumped at the chance because I think this might be the best technique atheists have going for them when it comes to talking with a believer. We've got a lot of stuff to cover here. For the objectives of my talk, I'm going to show a brief three minute or so clip to give you a taste of what street epistemology is. I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of debate. I do think debate has its place, but I think street epistemology edges that out in certain instances. I'm going to talk about the components of an effective street epistemology conversation, what makes up a good talk, and then I'm going to show some examples on the screen of situations that you yourself might have found, or found yourself in and what would be the typical way that an atheist would respond to that and the more effective street epistemology way. And then I have a conversation with a woman who believes in karma. We're going to play that video and pause it at certain points and we're going to break it down so you can see exactly what's going on to truly understand what this technique is all about. Now I did a test and I'll have to play the video outside the presentation, but just let me set this up. I am standing on a college university, much like I am right now, and just flagging people down. Hey, do you have five minutes to chat about a God belief? And you'd be surprised at how many people say, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to talk with you about that. And I record the conversations and I put them on YouTube primarily to get practice talking with believers. If I were just to wait and wait for these conversations to happen organically, it would take me probably 10 years, I think, to get to the point where I am now, even though I live in Texas, okay, where there are believers everywhere. So I try to initiate these conversations. But one of the main things I hope that you walk away from this talk is that you don't have to initiate. You can wait for these things to happen organically, for these talks to happen organically. So Miguel is on a university campus. He sees me having conversations with his classmates and he walks up to me and he agrees to a five minute talk. So this video will play for about two minutes or so 
and then it will fast forward through all the questions that I ask and then at the end you can see the response. I selected this clip primarily because we have John Loftus here, the, the originator, the one that, that put the emphasis on the outsider test for faith. And that is the technique. That's one of the techniques that I end up using in this talk. And that's why I thought this would just be perfect to share. One other thing. At the end of this conversation, he's playing with a bottle label. And he's like unraveling the bottle label. And it pops like right at the point where I asked this question. How can you possibly be at the 100% mark on the confidence of your belief? I just want to throw that out there just in case you can't hear that. Miguel. Well. What God do you believe in, dude? I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Why? Because I know he died on the cross and I know he's the almighty God. Okay. How confident are you that the belief is true? If, if 100% was, I'm 100% confident that Jesus died on the cross for me, and 0% is I'm not confident at all that Jesus died for me, where would you be on the scale? On the 100%. Wow. Yeah. Although sometimes, it may feel, sometimes I may feel like I struggle with my faith sometimes, you know, like, you know how we, sometimes you go through things and we feel like God's not, God's not here, and in reality, <laughs> you know, we, we share, we share away from Him. He never leaves us. And okay. so, I, I always know, like, I, You just know it? Yeah. How do you know it, dude? How, how, how could you be 100% confident on a belief? If you have no way of knowing if you are more correct in the belief than that Muslim woman, how could you possibly be at the 100% mark on the confidence of your belief? I don't know. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it, Miguel. Yeah. That conversation worked well because it embodied what street epistemology is all about. It's having a conversation with somebody that believes in something, possibly for a bad reason, but talking to them in a way, communicating with them in a way that doesn't close them down, that encourages them to honestly think about how did I arrive at this belief? And the Outsider Test for Faith, which, it's, it's a shame that I, I have the full version of this, and I was tempted to show it to you, but it's like 11 minutes long, so I wanted to jam that in there. And there will be a longer video that will, that will pull apart. Couldn't Miguel's God exist? Possibly. But how does he know that that's the case? We live in a society where the information's out there, but people often don't even think about why do I even hold this belief in the first place. And that causes a real harm in society. For example, we have congressmen that think global warming is a hoax. That the moon landing maybe never happened. That a piece of bread can turn into the body of Christ or that Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse. We have lots of people that are holding beliefs that don't seem to be based on any good reason, any good methodology. So how do we fix this? How do we, how do we approach this dilemma that we're facing? Well, there's a couple of different ways, and one of them is to debate. And we have some, some wonderful debaters right here in this very room. John Loftus, Dan Barker, uh, Lucian Greaves will be deba debating tomorrow. Debate definitely has its place. But how does it usually work? You have two opponents arguing, and do the opponents ever change their minds? Now, a lot of people shaking their heads no. No, they don't. But there are people that are in the audience watching that will change their minds. So I think debate does have its place. However, the people that are watching the debates aren't having a debate when they go out and argue with somebody, right? Usually it's a one-on-one -on -one 
conversation, right? They're not arguing and having a, th a thousand people watch. So what I think is happening, what I think, one of the things that's setting the atheist community back is that we'll watch debates and think, ah, that's the way I need to handle my Aunt Marcy when I talk to her next, all right? Or my Uncle Larry when he goes on about how uh, President Obama was responsible for Benghazi, for example. So I don't want to diminish debates because I think there are a lot of people that are atheists now that watched the debate and they were convinced. When you're neutrally observing a debate and you're, you're passively watching it and you're, you're, you're distancing yourself from the conversation, it could definitely change your mind. But in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, we know, the evidence is clear. If you argue with somebody, if you present facts, they're more than likely going to double down on what they believe. Okay, just something weird about the human being that, that we do that. So I suggest engaging with people rather than enraging them in a debate. And that, that here comes straight epistemology. So epistemology is the study of knowledge. It's how people form beliefs, how people come to know something that's true. And what I found is that this method of a Socratic conversation where I'm simply asking a person questions in a friendly manner, respectful, I'm not yelling at them, uh, I'm, I'm listening to what they have to say, I'm repeating it back to them, that this seems to be a better approach when it comes to helping a person examine how on earth did I form this belief that I'm holding? Okay, if you're going to argue with somebody, those walls will go up and they're not going to listen. They're not going to even listen to themselves. They'll be so defensive. So I think street epistemology is the way to go. And we're going to talk all about street epistemology today. Uh, first of all, it's not magic. All right, this is not some Jedi mind trick. Um, it's, not a, it's, it's not some sort of inherent you know, trait, but it is a skill. And it's a skill that anybody can learn. Uh, it took me a while to learn how to do this. And I had to make these conversations happen. I had to, to initiate them. And you can actually watch my videos. I have some videos on my YouTube channel where you can see the horrible way that I started off doing it to where I am now. And I, I hope to illustrate the progress uh, that where I'm at now with that last video that I'll show at the end of this talk. But the key to street epistemology, the key to learning how to effect, effectively converse with a believer, is practice. Now, I realize not everyone is comfortable going out with a whiteboard and flagging people down and just chatting with people, right? I mean, that's kind of, you know, it's hard to do. But you can go out on social media. You can create an account and just go to the Fox News Twitter channel and start finding people to talk to there. I mean, there's no lack of people out there to talk to. I want to go over some of the crucial elements, the components that make up a good conversation where you can say, ah, yeah, that was definitely street epistemology. Uh, the first thing is you want to have two willing parties. If I'm not interested in conversing with somebody or the other person just doesn't want to have the conversation or they're in preach mode, then don't have the conversation. You want to have two willing parties first. It's important to build rapport. This is one of the things that I, I suck at, basically. I, I am so focused on wanting to have the talk that I forget to say, well, how are you? What, you know, how's your day going? What are you studying here? That type of thing. So try to build rapport. And then if you can, identify the claim. What is it that the person is saying that they believe in? Sometimes you might get deluged with 30 things. I, I believe in this, 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 and this. Well, try to narrow it down to just one thing and, and try to have the conversation focus on that one topic. Listen respectfully. This is something most people have a hard time, and I, I struggle with this as well. When I'm having a, a talk with somebody, sometimes I'm, I'm thinking about the next question that I'm going to ask that I, I'm not even listening to what they're saying, and that's bad. All right, so just t take a second to actually listen to what they're saying. What I found with, with these Socratic conversations of street epistemology is that they go where the person you're talking to is taking you. So it's critical that you listen to the, the, the things that they're telling you. Modeling behavior. Uh, that is acting in the way that you would like the person to act towards you. 
if there's a street preacher out here uh, in uh, speaker circle and they're just yelling and you walked up to them and yell, 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 then th you're, you're meeting them where they're at. But if you just walked up to them and just approached them just gently, how are you doing? Can we talk after you're done preaching? And you're, you're just nice, gentle, soothing tones. More than likely, they're going to ratchet it down and you could probably have a better conversation because of that. Another big part of street epistemology is repeating back what you've heard. If somebody explains that some reason why they think that Jesus is God, listen to what they say and repeat it back to you. Just so I understand, are you telling me that you believe Jesus exists because of this, this, and this? Is that right? Let them hear back what it is they're telling you. And try to end on good terms. Okay? Sometimes when we talk to a believer or or somebody that we disagree on, uh, somebody that has a, a belief that we disagree on, oftentimes we end the talk and the last thing we want to do is run into them, them again. Uh, if that were to happen, I would say that that would be a failure when it comes to street epistemology. The goal with this technique is to have follow-up conversations with a person. All right, So it's not just a one-off, that you can have multiple conversations. I wanted to throw some examples up on the screen here. All right, let's say that you're waiting in the doctor's office and you're chatting with somebody for 10 minutes or so. And the guy next to you says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Did you ever hear that? Yeah, I've heard that too. What do we typically say? Well, that's nice. We blow it off. Why do we do that? Why do we as atheists just ignore, ignore that? That's an opening. Okay? You don't have to be standing on the street and flagging people down, but if somebody opens the door for you to have a conversation where it's polite, push back a little bit. How about this? Instead, if you don't mind, what do you mean by that? Is there anything wrong with that response? No, I mean, a response like that is probably, gonna, probably going to incentivize the person to tell you what they mean. And let me tell you, if somebody says they're a sinner saved by grace in public in a doctor's lounge, they're probably willing to tell you why they think that that's the case. Okay? <laughs> All right, somebody might say this. The second law of thermodynamics disproves evolution. Show of hands, who has heard this response from a believer? About a third of the room. Yeah, I've heard it a lot too. It's frustrating. What do we usually say as atheists? Name the first and third laws right now. I challenge you. Will a believer, what kind of response would a believer have if you were to give them that response? Would they kind of get defensive, maybe, or, or lash out? Probably so. How about this one here? Uh, what evidence would you accept to prove evolution? Now, that's a good question. Okay, so... Street epistemology is all about asking questions that keep peeling back the layers of why a person holds the belief in the first place. Just a hint, if somebody's evidence-based, if they say they're evidence-based on the reason why they hold their belief, ask them what evidence they would accept to change their mind. The Bible is true because of fulfilled prophecies. Oh, I, I hate this one. <laughs> Are there any Jehovah's Witnesses or former JWs here, just by a show of hands? A couple. Okay. Prophecy is big with the JWs, I found. So, typical atheist response. Uneducated goat herders wrote that book. <laughs> a response like this is probably going to end the conversation or or it will continue and it will just keep like going on like a downward spiral. How about this? Would another book with ten more fulfilled prophecies be more true? That's not bad. By the way, if they say no to this question, they don't believe in their God because of fulfilled prophecies. Okay, last one. Allah is the one true God. Street epistemology is not just for talking with Christians, okay? You can use it for any God belief. And you can use it for a variety of other topics too, which we're going to get to. We might say this, you're certainly entitled to your beliefs. 
There's nothing wrong with that response. We probably all agree everyone's got a right to believe in whatever they want. But it doesn't challenge the person who holds the belief. In fact, a response like this might give them the impression that you agree with the belief that they hold. And if you don't believe it, why would you ever want to give that impression? Especially now, or at least at the end of this talk, you should have a pretty good idea of what street epistemology is. You're going to have tools in your arsenal to have a conversation with a person that might say something like this. How about this instead? John will like this one. Hindus say the same thing about Vishnu. Who's more correct? Outsider test for faith right there. Faith is typically why people believe in a god, for example. I hate to break it to you, but it's usually not evidence. Even when somebody says, I have evidence for my God, when you start asking questions, it almost always comes down to faith. And let me be clear. People generally use faith as a method for coming to a truth. Now, I'm not saying that that's a reliable method. I don't think faith is reliable. Based on a person's definition, I would probably say it's not reliable. But when a person says they believe something because of faith, they're using it as a way to come to know that that belief is true or not. I want to go over a couple of examples where you might hear somebody use faith. I know Jesus exists because I have faith. Faith is the whole thing. You can't know anything without it. When you have faith, you don't need evidence. It's a gift. When somebody mentions that they believe something because of faith. Please, please don't give up on them. I've heard a lot of prominent atheists say, if I talk to a believer and they tell me they believe something because of faith, it's over, it's done. There's nothing more I can do for them. They're hopeless. Don't, no, no, no. That's the finish line. You're so close to helping that person. It's simply a matter of understanding what they mean by faith getting their definition of what that is, and then asking questions to determine if faith is reliable. Is faith a reliable method for concluding what you think is true? Don't give up on them. Okay, street epistemology is not just for God beliefs. I mentioned that before. And in fact, during my intro, uh, I've had conversations with people about ghosts, magic, aliens, pornography, abortion, gun control, open carry, all sorts of different topics. I personally, personally like talking with people who believe in gods because I found that many of those other beliefs, especially political ones, are resting on the God belief. In fact, um, when I realized that I didn't believe in any God, it was like the blinders came off, and I see things completely different now because I don't have that faith, those faith goggles on. So my political landscape completely changed when those are gone. You can use street epistemology for political topics, like I mentioned, or even for the mundane. If your kids say, you know, hey, mom, dad, we, we need a new dog, that's a perfect time to have a conversation where you can use these techniques. I want to show you a video with a young woman named Kiana. I meet her on the street as a total stranger. And the video is about eight minutes long. And it's going to pause seven times so that I can break it down for you. I'm going to tell you, OK, watch for this, watch for this. And then I think you'll get a kick out of it. The reason why I picked this particular uh, interview is because it's not about God. I picked it because I want you to see that street epistemology is not just about God talk, but also because we may be so focused on gods or not believing in God that if we pick a completely different topic, maybe I'm thinking it might, might distance you a little bit from the topic so that you could be a little bit more objective while you watch it. And the other thing is this video is on Rails, so I have like a 20-second break to tell you what's coming up in the next clip before it goes. In this video, I initiate a conversation with a complete stranger on a university to conduct street epistemology. I realize not everyone is comfortable initiating talks, but I do so in order to practice. Please pay attention to the brief rapport building here at the start. Hi. 
Do you have five minutes for an interview? Sure. All right, awesome. How you doing? Good, how are you? I'm good. I'm live streaming and recording. You down with that? Yeah. All right. My name's Anthony. Hello, Anthony. I'm Kiana. Hi. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> you too. Such a smiling face. Are you happy for about something? Or you um, have good news? Or <laughs> you look really happy? Well, school's out, so... Yeah. Yeah. And you have finals that. next week? Yes. I'm, I had some earlier this week, and now I have some Okay. Today. May I get the spelling of your first name? K-I-A-N-A. Kiana. Yes. All right, cool. Key. In this next clip, I encourage my conversation partner to pick a topic. I also try to make her comfortable and tell her that the discussions are usually fun and non-confrontational. I like to time the talks to five minutes to keep them brief and to respect people's time. All right, my name is Anthony, and what I do is just flag down random people walking by okay. to ask them if they hold any deeply held belief that they want to spend five minutes just chatting about, and I time it for five. Deeply and held. Yeah, it could be about anything. Usually it's like spiritual stuff, mm -hmm. but it could, it could really broach any topic, mm, like okay. gods, karma, magic, ghosts, that type of stuff. Let's see. Do you want to burn five minutes and just chat about something like yeah, that? Yeah, let me, would you chat okay. with me or am I just strictly talking? I'm going to ask questions. Okay, good. And I want to understand why you believe it. Okay, cool. And it's going to be completely like non-confrontational okay. and probably even okay. fun. Go for it. Okay. Time, five minutes, all right. Okay. So you can pick any topic you want. Okay, um, let's go with karma. Karma? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. It's important to understand people. Ask your interlocutor to define words. Asking for examples is a great way to understand what a person believes. Notice how I repeat back what I am hearing to ensure clarity. Before we even get any further, okay. how do you define it? Because I want to make sure I understand it. Hmm, let's see. I would say good or bad, what you do can eventually come back to you. Okay. Good or bad. And that's karma. Yeah. Do you have a, a really vivid example of something that happened that you would say, karma? Ooh. For me personally, I feel like whenever I say something mean about someone in my head, or if I speak it out in public, um, I'll like break out. And honestly, that's probably not why I break out, but I'll be like, karma. Oh. As simple as karma. Interesting. Karma for being, being ugly. If you don't think or say anything bad about a no, person. No, if I do. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But if you if you don't say anything bad or think anything bad about a mm -hmm. person, do you notice a difference in your complexion? Honestly, like right now, my skin's on a good on a good turn, and I haven't been thinking ugly thoughts. So. Okay. <laughs> wow. But that's just a small tidbit of something. Like if I litter. Okay. Something bad. I have bad luck, so something bad will happen, and I'm just like, it's because I littered. Okay. Yeah. So if you were driving home, mm -hmm. heading home, and you tossed out some trash on the road, mm -hmm. and something bad happened to you later, you would... Attribute it to that. You'd attribute it to that? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> While it's not required, I like to propose a scale of belief to see how certain a person is that their claim is true. I want you to watch and see how I keep asking questions and repeating back what Kiana is telling me. I'm a strong believer in karma, and if I do something good... You're really strong. Yeah. How sure are you that it's true? Zero to 100. 100% 100 all confidence, no doubt. Zero percent uh, all doubt. I would say... 82%. 82? It soon matters, yes. What do you study here? I study communication. Okay. 82% <laughs> yeah. confident that karma is real, that it mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go to this example of you... Go heading home, okay. trash out the window. Mm -hmm. What would be an example of something happening that you would attribute to that action? Hmm, common things. I either break something or... You break a dish or something and... Yeah, break something. Something will break a nail. Okay. It's just little things. I'm just like, you know, this is because I littered. Okay. Is there a certain amount of time that can pass? Usually happens within the day. Within a 24-hour period within of time, hours. you'll get karmically mm -hmm. punished for a bad action. Mm -hmm. Wow! <laughs> Keep asking polite questions to better understand what the person believes and why. 
watch for when I get confused and I tell her that I'm not following her. I do that so that I can better understand what she's telling me. And I, I don't know. I just attribute it to those things because if you, if you live a good life, ultimately, good things will happen to you. That's how I feel. Mm. Mm. If you did live, if you didn't litter, didn't and litter. you didn't think bad things about mm -hmm. people or call names mm -hmm. or whatever, and you were just good for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. would you never experience bad things? I think it all goes into my mindset as well. So if I think, if I live a good life and something does, something bad does happen to me, I feel like I would have a better mindset towards it. Like, oh, it's not that bad. You know what I mean? Like, no. okay, let me, let me, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, so if I did something bad, okay. if something bad happened, I would attribute it to that thing and I'd be like, I'm not living a good life. Yes. But if I lived a good life and something bad happened to me, I would have a better mindset towards it. Like it wouldn't it wouldn't get to me as much as if I did something bad before. Does, am I making any I, type of I sense? think I understand. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. You have a better outlook on life when you do positive things. Right. Even if something bad happens. Even if something bad happens to you, you'll be able to handle it better. Because you're just mm -hmm. like... So keep probing deeper. And I want you to notice how I stop asking questions coming up in this clip when it becomes apparent that she's thinking. She's thinking it through. Knowing when to be quiet and listen respectfully is difficult, but it is a crucial step to foster an environment of self-discovery. Yet how would you know that you being good and avoiding all this how would you know that it's not karmic punishment how would i know it's not mm. i guess it really just still goes back all into how i feel like my mindset just i'm doing positive things so this can't be a punishment for all the positive things i've done it's just things happen i don't know I'm, things I'm happen crazy. yeah i'm like am i, am I crazy we have 10 seconds. Okay. And we can go longer if you have the time. Okay. How do you differentiate karmic punishment from things happen? Mm. I think it would be just things that are just, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Uh, oh, that is a good question. You're making me really think my whole life. Hmm. I don't know. I feel like it would just, if I did something bad and something bad happened immediately after, I feel like this is, this has to correlate. Like, this is punishment. God's telling me don't do that again. I don't know. That was a good question. Because I don't, I'm trying to think of anything bad that's happened and I feel like I've been doing good. I usually just brush it off because I, like I said, my mindset's in a different place. If I haven't done anything wrong, I'm just like, it'll get better. It's almost like a snowball effect for me. If I do something bad and then something bad happens, I'm just like, oh my gosh. And then my mindset is in such a bad place. Maybe karma is not even just something bad happening to you, but just getting you in a in a space that just, well, at least for me, getting you in a space that just, to make you live a better life in the end. Huh. Now I'm like, that percentage looks a little 82%. I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> okay. It's time to wrap things up. Let's, let's be gentle, respectful, sincere. Let's revisit the belief scale. You want to try to end the talk on good terms so that you can meet again. People need time to think these things through. If you have no way of telling the difference between karmic punishment mm -hmm. and things just happening, mm -hmm. why believe in it at all? Hmm. I guess it's just something I live by. It's gonna get me through, honestly. Is 82% the most accurate spot to be on the confidence? Now it isn't. 
I would. Now you're gonna make me go back home and think about this, and I'm like, I need to tell him. Okay. I'll give you a card when we're done, so you can. Okay, good. Can it again. Because if I get it, I'm gonna be like, okay, I have it. Let's see. I would say now that I'm a little unsure. I would go with 53 because I still believe it. I'm like, where am I going with this? 53 now. Thank you so much for your time. You're awesome. Thanks. You are too. That type of conversation is not uncommon. Uh, even with God believers, you can generally see some movement on the confidence of somebody's belief. If you just simply ask Socratic questions, why do you think that? What makes you think that that's true? Tell me more about that. Can you give me an example? This is an effective approach. This is a, a snapshot of Kiana during the conversation. It's like that thinker's pose. She's deep in thought, thinking about, why do I think that this is true? If I had teased her about karma or told her that it was stupid or that there's no facts for karma, come on. I mean, are you, are you 12? There's no way that I would have reached this particular type of response in the conversation. And I like showing that. And here is... Kiana at the end of the talk, perhaps even more importantly, right? This conversation was probably a shock to her, to her belief system, but she seems grateful for the conversation. In fact, uh, if you're really interested in this talk, she comes back 10 minutes later and we continue the conversation and she lowers her confidence even more. Okay, wow. she's a great person. There are thousands of people who want to live in a world where everyone strives to believe things that are true, including myself. <laughs> and these kind of talks, I think, are the best way that we can make that happen. Now, do we have an obligation to help people? I think we do. I think many of the reasons why we debate with somebody is because we want them to know that they're mistaken on something. We want to help them. But we know that debates in a one-on-one -on -one talk tend to shut a person down, tend to make them defensive, and tend to make them double down on what it is they believe. With this method of street epistemology, it's a tool. It's an effective tool in talking with a believer that encourages them to investigate honestly, why the hell do I believe this thing? And I'd like you to push back a little. You know, I don't understand why we sit on the sidelines. If, if you're on an airplane and somebody opens up a Bible next to you and wants to chat t with you about Jesus, don't just blow it off. I understand that not everyone wants to initiate these talks, but if somebody opens the door for you, you don't have to debate with them and, and think that you're going to get in an argument and cause a scene on the airplane. With this approach, you don't need to. You can have a, a very calm, respectful dialogue, and at the end of the talk, if you do everything right, I mean, it's not hard to do. Um, you might end up learning something, and they will definitely end up learning something as well. That ends the talk. I want to open it up to a Q&A session at this point. I have so many videos that I would love to show you, and it was so difficult to boil down to just those two, particularly with, with John Loftus here and wanting to show the outsider test for faith. Um, please, uh, how are we on time? Another 15 minutes? Does that sound about right? Okay. Right here in front. Have I ever asked somebody to talk and they said that I'm an atheist? Absolutely. Those I find, it's weird. Um, you would think that they would be challenging conversations because atheists tend to be skeptical, but what I learned is that not every atheist is skeptical. I've had some interesting talks with atheists that believe that they have a soul, that they do believe in karma, and uh, all sorts of different supernatural beliefs. So I was a little surprised to, to find that. Um, there was one conversation with a woman who was skeptical and an atheist. She was raised by skeptics. And I didn't have anything to talk with her about. Um, so that was a little unusual. But generally, if I talk to an atheist, it does not mean that they're skeptical. And it doesn't mean that they don't believe in ghosts or aliens or... And there, of course, there are a variety of political topics that we could talk about as well. So, yeah. Right here in the center. So the question is, would street epistemology work good in a political environment? 
and absolutely. And it, what you've described is my fantasy. Like, I would love to have a Socratic conversation with a Donald Trump, with a Bernie Sanders. I mean, you can use it for anybody. Um, it's not, it doesn't just have to be somebody that, that, opposes, that holds an opposing view. Um, I once had a conversation with a woman about pro-choice, and I'm pro-choice. And at the end of the talk, she wasn't sure where she was, and I even was kind of reflecting on my position, too. So, but that's the beauty of the technique. And absolutely, can it be used for political conversations? Yes. And I would love to see uh, either the, 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 the opponents themselves have these types of conversations, or somebody familiar with the technique doing it with them. Right in the back, John. Yeah, you do that so You're too charitable. Um, so the question is, have I ever had a conversation with somebody and they don't drop their confidence in the belief? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it happens. And I've been live streaming my, I've been going out with my, cam my, my phone and well, as well as my GoPro and live streaming it. So you can literally see me have two hours of conversations and then I upload three of them to YouTube. And, and sometimes I have a talk and they're like, nope, uh, faith is the best way to go and there's nothing that's going to change my mind. Sometimes you do get people like that. It's, it's unfortunate. But if you can create an environment that encourages a person to be open and honest and that there's no wrong answer, please just be blunt. Be, be honest with me. Um, if you can create an environment for that, um, more often than not, they will typically realize that they don't have a good reason for holding the belief. And sometimes the, the, the drop in confidence doesn't happen on camera, but well after the fact. I give a card now to people so that they can e email me later, and they might just send me a number. Like, they might send me a 60. You know, I, okay, I know where she's at now. That type of thing. Right here. Um, well, so I have to say, first of all, uh, when you began your talk, I was a bit skeptical. Imagine that, skeptical atheist. But uh, <laughs> I guess, so, so for, first comment, then a question. I, what I just witnessed kind of blew my mind. Well, so the question, or I think more of the statement is, there are some atheists that don't feel comfortable going out and engaging with people. They'd rather just let it happen because of a bad experience. And that's, that's completely fine. But there are a lot of people that do want to engage with believers. And what I find is that the, the atheists that do tend to be the angry, uh, angry ones, <laughs> where you just can't wait to tell them how stupid they are. But that doesn't work. That's going to close them down. So th that's a big part of this. If this isn't in your comfort zone, then don't do it. Like, find a different way to support people that are having the talks. Like, if you're good at video editing, help me out. You know, help me out that way. That could be a way that you can help out, and you don't have to worry about talking to people. So, yeah, it's not for everybody. Yes, sir. That's a good question. If I could sum that up, you're saying, you're asking, do I find if more religious people are, tend to be less skeptical and more accepting of just whatever you tell them? Um, I hate to generalize. I hate to generalize, but maybe, maybe yes. Maybe yes. But then again, I, I run into a lot of atheists that are not skeptical, too. So what I find generally, just by running to the everyday person on the street, is that people, while they may not, while they may not be skeptical, while they may not have good critical thinking skills, at the heart of it, they do want to believe things that are true. If you have that, if you can find a person that wants to believe true things, that's 90% of it. Then it's just a matter of, of talking to them, under, understanding what it is they believe and why. So that, I think that's how I probably answer that. Yes, sir. So the question is, would, would I use a different approach or the same approach with a family member as opposed to a stranger? No, I'd use the exact same approach. But I think it's more difficult because like, if I started using this with my brother, he might be like, why is Anthony asking me these weird Socratic questions? <laughs> he never talks to me this way. 
And why does he have this timer? No, I wouldn't have. <laughs> I wouldn't have the timer. But um, I think it is more difficult with family members because they're so used to it. They they know you. Whereas with a stranger, I can be Anthony, the street epistemologist, and be you know, here's my questions. Um, but I have used these techniques with family members to great success. So it can be done, but it's different. Um, I should just add, uh, if you're interested in learning anything more about this, there's a private street epistemology Facebook group. It's closed, or it's, well, it's private. Um, submit a join request, we'll add you. There are thousands of people that are having these types of talks with great success. And 99% of the people that are using the technique don't go out with a camera. Okay, I don't want you to think that I have to use a camera to do this. But they're having these types of talks from all over the world. They're sharing their successes and failures in this group. And I'm able to learn from them, and they're able to learn from me, and it's great. And we even talk about conversations with loved ones, family members, that type of thing. Do we have time for one more question? One more question. Or was that it? Oh, right here. Somebody else asked me that. Am I keeping track of data? I'm not. Mainly because, honestly, I don't know what a success is. I might have a conversation with somebody and they say, I'm 100% sure, and then at the end of the talk, like Miguel at the front there, at the start, he said, I don't know. Well, that's a success, I think, right? If someone's 100 and then they say they don't know, they must have dropped, but I think they get a number. Or let's say that they don't drop, or they do drop. Like, in order to measure something, we need to know what is a failure and a success, and I have no clue on how to measure this type of thing. If that's an area of expertise of anyone watching this video or out in the audience, please contact me because we want to know if this works. We also want to know if this harms people. If this is harming people, we want to stop. It doesn't seem to be the case. You saw Kiana. That, that response from Kiana smiling is typical. And I'll often get emails from people months later saying, thank you so much for the talk. Um, but nobody's studying it yet, but I wish, uh, but that's really we, where we need to head next. Yeah. That's a really good, yeah, yeah that's an interesting thing. Like, I think it's a lot easier to see movement from a person about karma because you're not socially penalized for saying, I don't believe in karma, as opposed to saying, I don't think there's a God. So I think it's safer to abandon a belief like that um, as opposed to a God belief. I had a conversation with a guy, uh, one last thing, I had a conversation with a guy about karma, and by the end of it, he dropped his confidence drastically, and, I, and he had mentioned, at the start, we were like, do you want to talk about karma or God? And he said, karma. So we talked about karma. He, lost, he basically diminished his, his confidence in that. And then at the end of the talk, I said, do you want to shift gears now and talk about God? And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> But anyways, I think it's, a, it's an effective technique. I urge you to please look into it. I think this is the best thing going for an atheist that wants to have a conversation with a loved one. There are hundreds of conversations on my YouTube channel, which is, oh, it's a Magna Bosco 210. Please go there. I've got a playlist of my top five and uh, so some tutorials. And then there's that private group that I mentioned on Facebook as well. Thank you very much.